everybody, I'm Scott, and welcome to the Shelfware Podcast. This time, uh, I've got Noah here with me. Hey, Noah. Hey, Scott. How are you? And doing good, doing good. Man, thanks for inviting me back. Oh, of course, of course. Noah's from the BookTube channel, Everyone Who Reads Must Converse. Definitely a channel you should check out. But he's joined us for part two of our Hyperion Cantos discussion. And uh, last time I had Noah on, we talked about Hyperion and the fall of Hyperion. And now we're going to talk about Endymion and the rise of Endymion. And with this, that completes the Hyperion novels of uh, Dan Simmons. So yeah, those this was quite a read. I mean, it must have been what... 3,000 pages total. That's right. I mean, man, what a uh, what a series. And our first, you know, hour or so that we talked about it, it was so awesome. But this definitely requires a part two, right? <laughs> definitely. There's no, <laughs> I no mean, question. Uh, yep. What an amazing thing that Dan Simmons has done with this series. I really hope that people that really enjoy Hyperion really get into what Dan Simmons does with Endymion here. This is epic, philosophical, sp- or, or spiritual sci-fi. So awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I said last time that I thought uh, Hyperion, the first novel, was a masterpiece, in my opinion. And then uh, The Fall of Hyperion had some troubles that, that we talked about, in my opinion, again. And then um, you know, these two, I think that they're, they're kind of in the middle, right? I, I, again, I don't think either of them hit Hyperion level, that first novel. But I, I really enjoyed them. And the more I've thought about them after finishing them, the more I like them as well. Um, but they're, again, like the first two, these two are really one thing. They're one story, even though they kind of shift gears right in between the two. You know, when you when you finish the first book, you kind of need to get to the second one because it, it's not. Done. Um, I, yeah. I, look, I look at it the same way that um, Dan Simmons probably wrote these two also as one big story. He had his idea and he knows and he knows where he's going with it and all that kind of thing. But it's such a master storyteller that. You know, uh, every one of these books, all four of them, have their own feel. And Endymion and Rise of Endymion definitely have two different kind of uh, kind of things that they do. And I would definitely say that the end of this series is on the level of, you know, the first Hyperion book and just, just the highest level of sci-fi that, that we can get to, even if... You know, the, these two as a whole might not be as strong as the first Hyperion uh, and, and Fall of Hyperion books mm-hmm. that, they, that they get there. So, um, cool. yeah, let's get to it. All right, yeah. So um, where we left last time, uh, the hegemony, uh, the head of the hegemony, uh, Mina Gladstone, she pulled some plugs, right? <laughs> Uh, she, right. she destroyed the Farcaster portals, which is really where this come this book comes from. You know, uh, so we're about 250 or something years in the future after that, the fall of Hyperion. But the fall of right. Hyperion, like we ended in the, the last podcast, was an extinction level event uh, on some planets. It was it was a major deal because farcasters or were portals through which you could go to other worlds and that was uh you know this is how commerce happened this is how you got food to places as well as entertainment right for the rich folks so what we'll do I, again we're going to give a quick spoiler free synopsis or a, a review of the these last two novels like we did in the last one and then we'll jump into spoiler territory and really talk about some good stuff sounds good now we're we're later right and we meet this guy named Rawl and Dimian. And Rawl and Dimian is in a box, basically, right? You know, uh, the very first lines of this book are, um, you are reading this for the wrong reason. If you are reading this to learn what it was like to make love to a Messiah, our Messiah, then you should not read on because you are a little more than a voyeur. If you're reading this because you're a fan of the old poet's cantos, and are obsessed with curiosity about what happened next in the lives of the Hyperion pilgrims, you will be disappointed. (laughs) Right. You know, you think that Stan (laughs) Simmons may be reacting to maybe some criticism he got for the fall of Hyperion. That, Um, and also, I mean, he does what he's done 
this whole series so far is he shifts its perspective and gives you and gives you the story from where you're not expecting it. You know, we got we got multiple first person perspectives from the first one. And then the second one, we had the Keats Cybrid telling us the story. And then now we have a completely unknown character. Uh, Raw Endymion is other half of a, mes- a messianic figure. And that messianic figure we know from uh, Fall of Hyperion is the daughter of Brawny, who is um, the, the product of a coupling between a human being and a a techno core AI consciousness. Yep. So as we said last time, it's like a the next step in human evolution, kind of, or potentially right. so, right? Right. And her name is Ania. Ania. So we meet Raul. He's stuck in a box. It's kind of a Schrodinger box where he doesn't know if he's going to survive this. You know, it, it's like a, there's a some kind of an atomic thing. Um, I can't remember what he called it, but there's a vial that it will either break or not break. Due to right. the randomness of some atomic thing, right? So that so that there's no responsibility for his death, but um, um, it will happen at some at some point, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like rolling dice, right? Kind of right. like a a die roll. So he's stuck in there. You don't know at this point who stuck him in there, but he's writing this story from there. And he tells you that. He says, now I'm going to tell you everything that happened. And yeah. um, then he, he goes back and he, he uh, Raul and Dimian meets Martin Salinas from the first book, who is now right. pretty old. So, so yeah, he's like, a, he's like a guide and a trapper and a, a, a guy that, like, um, you know, facilitates these rich people who come to Hyperion. He's on our main planet, of course, Hyperion. And he um, is uh, facilitating excursions into Hyperion. So he's a wily guy. He knows his way around the wilderness and all that kind of stuff. And he gets caught up in a in 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 something bigger than he ever understands. Um, that first story where his dog died, and it is this thing where he ends up snapping and he actually kills somebody and he's tried and he's put to death that the the first and and this is not a spoiler for sure because he says it right off the rip the first <laughs> the first execution or whatever that's uh inflicted upon him or the second you know and so he's put to death by some kind of means and for some reason and he doesn't understand it it goes through and he wakes up in a tower with Martin Silius, which is the uh, the poet, the pilgrim yeah. from Hyperion. So good. Yeah, and then, um, really good. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, and then the story takes off, and he doesn't, and he's just like a pawn in this story. It's so affecting. Just right off the rip, we get a a sense because he doesn't know of the very human quality of Rol. Right. Ra- or Martin Salinas gives Rawl a mission. He's, uh, he's basically given them a few things. He says, find old earth and destroy the Pax, right. stop the Technicor, right? And then how he's going to do this is he's got to go find Aenea, who is this person that we just spoke about, who is coming through the time tombs into this time from the past. The main thing uh, here is that what has happened since, and this blew my mind the first time that I read the book, for sure. What has happened in the 300 years thereabout between Fall of Hyperion and Endymion is a, the church has risen up. The Catholic church has risen up in power and is called the Pax. And there is a human-wide control structure that was not in place before and it is predicated upon what we know as readers the cruciform this is an uh, immortality every three days after a death of a person they will be revived revived Mm -hmm. so death becomes a non-issue and that is laid out very very quickly at the beginning 
and it's it's kind of jarring, isn't it? It is. Yeah, absolutely. When when you when you first see that, I mean, I was totally jarred myself, and it is it is that kind of thing where you're just thrown into a whole different level of what is going on. So we don't hear about the technocore. We don't hear about the fate of the technocore or the or uh, that kind of thing at all. But we get very quickly where the human beings are. And we know as readers that the cruciform is a technology of the technocore. But it seems that the human population that has embraced this planet wide and galaxy wide, they do not know it. <laughs> they do not. They absolutely do not. Yeah. So you imagine that, that the PAX now is just super powerful. This everybody right. wants to be part of this religion because right. Right. You're, they're they're able to resurrect, right? So right. everybody wants in, right? And everybody is in, and now they've got just extreme power. And right. they are threatened by Aenea, right? They they called her an abomination, and they right. want to get Aenea as well. So now Raul, Raul, sorry, they, they say very specifically, it's spelled Raul, but it says very specifically in the book that it's pronounced like Paul. So it's Raul, right? So Raul, Raul is um, headed to... Uh, pick up Aenea, you know, when she comes out of the time tombs, but the Pax right. is also headed there. And the person that's in charge of them is Father De Soya. So he is in pursuit of Aenea under the right. command of the Pax. Right. So we meet two different, uh, you know, loosely uh, to say, we meet off the rip uh, two different levels of Pax. And that is the Vatican itself, which is basically not uh the pope because the pope is our old buddy uh <laughs> Lenyar hoyt right right who 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 has been as we see quick the priest or the pope for time after time after time after time and i mean he's he's the pope and and he is basically a figurehead and a pawn who we have in actual control is loud's army Right. So Loud's army is like this guy who is uh, the real power behind the packs. And then we have Father DeSoya, who is kind of like the executive. Right. Yeah, he's, he's, he's Father DeSoya, but he is like the captain of a, an Archangel class ship. <laughs> right. Called the Raphael. Okay, so, and, yeah. and, and, the, and, and I want to touch on this because this was so jarring as well. Because there's so much jarring at the beginning of Endymion to me. And um, it was that the Soya, his mission is destroying and eradicating ouster populations. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing. He's out there just sweeping and destroying um, the ousters. Anywhere he can find them, that's his mission. And we have an Archangel class ship show up. And what is that? That's a ship that can not just travel light speed, but travel so fast that it can actually go from one place in the galaxy to another in no time. Right. But it kills the person that's aboard. Everybody. It, it, yeah. liquefies, <laughs> it liquefies their body. But we that's how we find out that when it comes down to it, um, everybody who is a member of the Pax and a member of the church and all this kind of thing, um, death has become a non-issue. It is, it is a thing where uh, we, we, we're hearkening back to the first story in Hyperion where um, there's death, but then there's the true death. And nobody has to endure true death anymore. And if that and 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 that's a major major theme that we're going to be working out through yeah. this, I'm sure because oh, no doubt. Yep. Um, uh, that and that's one of the most jarring things because De Soya is approached by one, one of these archangel ships and called back to um, the planet that uh, the Vatican is on mm -hmm. that the Pax headquarters is at, and he's called back, so he goes back, and that is the first suicide basically a uh, conscious suicide that he does on himself mm -hmm. because that's what it requires to get back there and do that. And he's called back to the Vatican. So he does that. And 
then um and then he's given this other mission that is to get Ania. And his mission from then on is to To go to Ania, right. And it's basically um do a painful suicide every time you go somewhere. Every time you go somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we follow this and it's just multiple suicides. I mean, trigger warning, guys. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it is it is brutal. And when I when I kind of read it, I was just like, "What is happening here?" Um, and I and I think that's a testament to what Dan Simmons did in Fall of Hyperion, that he really did point out that uh, death is is such an essential part of life, and that's part of this story. And then he undermines that, and he shows a way that we can lose our, our humanity, and that's what that's what has happened so far, or just really quickly. And Father DeSoya um, has a wonderful uh, character arc where he starts to realize that. So, yeah. So, to finish the summary really quickly then. So, that's our setup, right? Now, we've got all the main players. And then now, uh, Ania appears at the Time Tombs. Things happen. And then she ends up with um, Rawl. And now, Rawl and Ania are running from the packs. And right. going from world to world over, and not these... just Rawl. Oh yeah, Rawl and a and a uh, android named Abedic. Yeah, right? because because uh... Uh, Salinas gave him an android too. <laughs> right. And then we end up with another villain that may even be scarier than the Shrike. <laughs> this we we know, we've already sure. mentioned the Shrike, um, but, but we will. We'll talk more about the Shrike uh, in a little bit, but. There is uh, something else that the that is is there, you know, that is in the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so unnerving to even think of. So that is pretty much what the first novel is, and there is it is a complete story. It doesn't end quite as abruptly as Hyperion, but really, when you're done, you you realize, oh man, there's so much more to go here. He's left a lot right. of things now that are now open. And we need to finish them up. And then you go into Rise of Endymion. And then when you start, when, when you, first of all, when you buy Rise of Endymion, it's like 700 pages long, you know? So it's longer than uh, uh, Endymion. And yeah, it's a beast. It is. It's a beast. It's a big one. So, um, but then in, the, in that book, now he's wrapping stuff up. But it, it shifts now from this this running thing to now dealing with all the things. They, he reminds you, Dan Simmons reminds you, hey, the guy that's telling this story is still in this box. Right. So here he right. is still in the box, and he's still writing this down, and we're reading it, right, um, which is just really cool. But he's still in that box at the beginning of um, The Rise of Indy, and we still don't know how what the box is, how he got there, who's uh, put, who's imprisoned him there. We still don't know who's done right. it. Right, but now he continues to write, and it, and it's hard to talk about this one without spoiling the other one. So we'll just be really brief, and then we'll really get into it. Um, cool. But but really, again, we've got all the players that we were just talking about. We've got the packs, we've got Rawl, we've got Salinas, we've got the Pope, we've got uh, basically a whole bunch of other religions that end up in play. And well, yeah, we've got we've got the Shrike. We've got the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Everything's here. And one of the things that you Everything. said to me when we when you finished reading it, because you finished it before I did, um, you said, man, that was a really satisfying ending. And it I is. have to tell you, I totally agree. When I was finished yes. with it, I thought, yeah, that he did he really did that well. Yeah, brother, he did. Um Dan Simmons did a really great job. I love uh Rise of Endymion, and I will say uh, just in a matter of no spoiling, mm -hmm. that uh, some of the deepest world building, I think, happens in Rise of Endymion because um, in Rise of Endymion, we're thrown back into one world. Like most of this book takes place on one world, and it is um, a world that we've never seen before mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the whole series. And Alnea and Raw and Bedek are there and they are living their life and they are teaching and doing their thing. And, um, it's just a, it's, it's kind of, again, a jarring kind of thing because you're just like, <laughs> you know, uh, 
in Rise of Endymion, or in Endymion itself, we went through so many different worlds. Yeah. That's the most world-heavy book of the series. And then we're on one world again, and we're getting deep into one world. But when it when it gets when it gets there, it doesn't play out too fast. It is masterfully done. I would say you know both of these are like a, a space opera. There's some of the smartest space opera I've ever read. There's a lot of very deep things going on in here. A lot of religions going on in here. Um, they're 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 very worthwhile to read. This is very unique among sci-fi because sci-fi writers don't go there. And Dan Simmons didn't even just go there, but then he presses and he presses you on and on. And um, he actually develops his own kind of um. I, I don't want to say cosmology because that's not the right word, but like a philosophy of of what it means to be human or what it means to be um, a, a consciousness. Um, he actually kind of develops his own philosophy or religion of what it means to be human in this, and it is it's satisfying. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's not. It's not. It's not something that that is as complex as as it sounds for me to say that, but for what it is, you can extrapolate all these uh, other things, and it's very satisfying because we already touched on a few of the things in the first book when we talked about the Omega Point and we talked about what um, Dan Simmons has you know puts on the table and. And and he's a such a literate writer and ultimately rooted in science and physics, but he touches on a level of being that is um, termed the void which binds, mm -hmm. and that is a scientific physics uh, level of reality, which is like the Planck, uh, which is like this level of being that everything is permeating, you know, like the smallest. Yeah. Like the, the space between everything. Right. Mm -hmm. That, 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 um, these entities, whether it be the Technicore or whether it be Ania, they, uh, the reason that they are who they are, the reason that they have the power and the level of, of beingness that they have is because they're in touch with this kind of level. And in truth, Every human being is in touch with this kind of level. This is just what it means to be. And Dan Simmons is using this very, very effectively to build his story. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Agreed. You know, there's not a lot of things that I can really compare this to. You know, and last time we talked right. about Dune, you know, but it, this is this is a, its own high level of science fiction that I think people's sense have um, tried to emulate a little bit. Um, right. just like, you know, people would emulate Dune or Lord of the Rings or something like that. And I, sure. I do honestly speak of this in that same realm. Oh yeah. I'm, 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 I'm with you there, brother. That's for sure. Cool. All right. So let's move in right now. There's our spoiler line. If, if anybody would like to read them before hearing us, uh, talk deeply about some of this stuff, please do. So, um, yeah, you talked about the Omega point. Um, and, and the first appearance of that again was, Remember that uh, Father Duray, he was elected Pope first, right? Of those two right. guys. And he took right. a name of Tel... T uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Tiliard? Tiliard? Uh, Tiliard. De Desjardins? Yeah. Tiliard, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but then when he died, Lenore Hoyt took over from him. And then Lenore Hoyt right. was the Pope for a long, long time. Would they kill Duray? Every time. Every time. And and we get and we get one time where we see it in the in the in the books, and then we can extrapolate that this is how Loud's army. We see uh, the kind of and now it's just a commentary of power corrupt kind of yes, thing. Yes, right. That uh, Hoyt is is you know never had a backbone. He was mm -hmm. always riding on Duray's kind of coattails, and and we saw that from the first two books. Yeah. And so Hoyt is this kind of figurehead, and Loud's army uh, is not a necessarily evil person, but he is on a wrong path, and he's made some bad decisions. So 
every time that Hoyt dies, he resurrects as Dore, just like Dore resurrects as Hoyt. It's a back and forth kind of motion. Dore wakes up, and Loud's army has to do it himself every single time because, uh, you know, you can't have more people. It's a need to know basis, mm-hmm. right? Right. And so he murders, effectively murders Dore. So that then, right then, it's another three days, and then we have Hoyt again as mm-hmm. a pope, and he's a figurehead that that then these other power structures can uh, right. just 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 kind of control. And we have more than one just power structure at play here. You know, there's Loud's army, who is he's he's at uh, in control, but we have the. AI or the technocore construct. Um, now I didn't know how to pronounce this guy's name because I'm a, I'm just a reader, so I mm-hmm. don't read out loud. But is is it Embeldo, Abledo, and and he is the persona of the technocore. You know, he's there in the fall. He's there. Uh, you know, three hundred years before this, but it's the same persona. The technocore has no need to um to kind of change that up because this is the technical can do whatever so this this being is in play as a power a part of the power structure of the packs and and we know as readers right then that this is the technical man this is the technical mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. are you doing <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah and but the the fascinating thing about all this is that it's this life and death thing that you were alluded to when we were talking before and how it's changed everything right so you have this church that is actually providing people with resurrection that people can see and now all of humanity's in there right but Rawl doesn't want to be part of that right and I'm sure you had other people in the in the in the world that didn't want it to be either, um, you know, because you remember back when um, Dure first got the cruciform, he knew it wasn't of God and he was trying to cut it out, right? right. And now here's the result of that failure to do so. Not it's not right. in saying anything negative about him because I thought he was pretty amazing, but this is the result of it is. Right. They use this for power. It's like, yeah, you you want to be baptized in this church because you need the cruciform, and uh, yeah. sorry if you if you don't become part of this church, you can't have it. And there and therein is the uh, the ultimate tragedy of Dure. Um, so far, because when it comes down to it, he he wakes up uh, in that scene that we see him, and he knows exactly. He remembers the mm-hmm. last time mm-hmm. that he was murdered by Loud's army. You know, he knows what's going on. And and he says, you know, okay, here we go. And, 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 and that's it. And so it's such a tragic, at least for right now, um, figure. And, and that's just what it is. And we're, and we're brought into this, into this world and this, to this galaxy and to this level of humanity where there's a paradox occurring. Mm. And that is that death is no longer like a, a, a necessary issue for human beings, yeah. but also it is like the most hardcore thing that can be leveled on somebody because there's multiple times in, in Endymion and Rise of Endymion where we meet people or there is the threat leveled on them that we're going to, you know, we, we can take your cruciform away We you will be excommunicated from the church or, or other people that meet the final death. As well, right? We meet people that, yeah, or, yeah, oh, yeah. That that person died, but that was the final death. So, yeah, the yeah. kid's gonna die from cancer or something. And they're like, well, we can give him the cruciform, and he will die, but then he'll be resurrected. And they're like, okay, do that. And they're like, well, you know, in order to do that, we have to give the cruciform to your whole family. And they're like, well, no, we don't want all that. You know, I mean. Uh, just, just, just save my son's life, you know. And they're like, no. Uh, the the way to do it is, uh, you know, to to bring the whole family into it. And it's you you get really quickly that something is amiss here. Like yeah, it's just well, not no, no doubt. I mean, not, extremely miss. And I love what you said there about how how um, you know death is both 
not an issue and the biggest issue there is <laughs> at the same time, at the same time. Right. Uh, and what that does so, to uh, people, you know, is um, right. really interesting, you know, so you're, you're bending the knee to get this. And not only that, but also there are still people in that church who know that this is wrong and are silently or not silently fighting against it. Right, because yeah. they're mortal now. Why not? You know, and so uh, just to stick with Endymion real quick, I mean, Father DeSoya is the other uh, really kind of human character that we get, I think, because he has a definite change, uh, just like Raul does. Raul and Father DeSoya are very human characters. They're the ones that we relate to while we're uh, reading this kind of thing. And Father DeSoya um, actually sees pretty quickly that Ania is not a threat. He doesn't, there's no, there's no reason to just bring down the hammer on her and to, and to terminate with extreme prejudice kind of thing. You know, no matter what his mission is, he sees pretty quickly that um, he wants to figure Ania out. He wants to know what is really going on. And Father DeSoya turns out to be a friend of Ania. Now, we haven't touched on the idea that, I mean, Ania can see somewhat of what is going to happen to her. She calls it remembering the future. Mm -hmm. And she remembers the future. And so, so she uh, does know that Father DeSoya plays a, a major part in her deliverance and in her, um, her, her whole story and her path. So... Through through the the quest of Endymion, that whole book, we have Father DeSoya repeatedly suiciding himself to try to keep up with Ania, in who is traveling through these Farcasters. And as we said, you know, the Farcasters are dead or were dead, but Ania can make them work. And what is it that is going on here to make them work? Mm -hmm. That is a one of the mysteries that we're working through the whole, yeah, uh, yeah, the whole book there. But um, he's completely, you know, suiciding himself until the point where she uh, she finally makes a break for the the ultimate hiding spot, which is <laughs> <laughs> old Earth. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where we were in Fall of Hyperion, her and uh, Endymion and, and, and Bedek finally get there. Mm -hmm. um, but not until they meet, um, you know, Raul. And so this whole point, we have also the time where they are just going, going, going and going through the Farcasters and seeing kind of things where there's they're seeing those worlds where. There is no where, where the humans have just been swept away and we don't understand why there's so much more mystery, just like in fall of Hyperion. There's so much there's stuff happening and we don't really understand why. Um, and then we get to uh, what is it? Set Dr Draconi, the ice world. Soul, soul Draconi. Soul, soul Draconi. Mm -hmm. That's right. The ice world. And on that world, um, we meet a, a another priest of the ch church that is um, Father Father Glaucus. Yep, he's an exiled priest, right? Just like Dure, mm -hmm. and he also has a an understanding of the Omega Omega Point and Teliar de Chardin. Yep. Right. So there, there's this idea that's fighting against. Um, the what the church has become, and right. uh, they still see this omega point as um, something that's going to happen, and uh, they want to shepherd people toward that, while the Pax is offering them uh, things they can't refuse, right? But it's right. not it's not getting them to where they the humanity needs to go. It's stunting them instead. And Ania is the key to it, right? Well, mm -hmm. and Ania shows up out of the of the time tombs with the shrike she is she is with the shrike the yep. shrike is with her and they and there is some kind of relationship there and we don't understand uh at the beginning 
But as it comes out, what the strike is, he fights for Aenea. He fights the Pax. He fights for Aenea. And so what is the strike? Okay, so the Technocore can't get away from its code. There is there is source code that creates the Technocore. Mm-hmm. And the source code that created the Technocore allows for itself to um, evolve. But then there is also a failsafe or, or kind of portion of the code that will um, destroy code and programs that are no longer useful. That portion of the code that is the decider and destroyer of things that are no longer useful in the Technocore, that is the inception of the Shrike. Mm -hmm. So the strike is there as what we have seen it in the first fall in in Hyperion and fall of Hyperion as a death dealer, as, as, as uh, something that is here to unflinchingly, unemotionally bring an ending. And that is uh, actually in line now with Aenea. Hmm. And so then, um, you know, it begs the question then, right? What is what is uh, the Technocore doing? What is what is going on with this? If if the Technocore is not, if if the Shrike is in line with Aenea, then wh- why isn't it aligned with the Technocore? What has the Technocore done to get, you know, where it is being not in line with the Shrike? Because they're obviously both from the same kind of place and i think that is the key or a key to what has happened with Aeneas' birth you mm-hmm. know that's the human right. aligning you know uh, marriage with the with the ai uh technical construct that now that portion which is death death is a part of life mm-hmm. and there's no getting away from it and the strike is death and so that uh the Shrike aligns itself with life. It doesn't align itself with what the Technocore is, and we'll get to that <laughs> in a little bit. Um, but um, the Shrike is along for the ride <laughs> with Aenea and Raw and Bedic, and, and, and he shows up at certain, or it shows up at certain points, and we just get it, and it's there, and we're just like, oh, God. <laughs> Why is the strike here? You know, Rawl mm-hmm. is is completely terrified, but you know, just you know, allowing it. I mean, what can you do instead? You know, it's uh, it's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, they finally make it to the um, the ice world there, and we have an an, an unbelievable, uh, evil, scary emesis show up. So Radamanth Nemes, she shows up as part of um, the crew of Father DeSoya. Right. And, um, she shows up as part of the crew of the Pax and the church. Yeah. So he's, uh, you know, she's, she's part of the, you know, because he goes back to the planet and he has to face everybody and they're like, oh, you've been failing, you know, and he says, yeah, I'm not, I'm not winning. <laughs> but then um, they, they assign him a new crew, right? And then off he goes and this Radamanth Nemes is one of the crew and we quickly realizes that she's not even human because we, because we, we, we know um, she's surviving these, um, these trips that kill everybody. Everybody right. else is resurrecting and she's fine. And then, you know, she pretends to resurrect when it suits her. And she's using that time in some points, she's using that time, those three days of resurrection to do her own, um, her own will, right. whatever, you know, mm-hmm. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And she is, um, you know, so near the end of Endymion is when things kind of come to a head with her and Aenea and then out comes the Shrike again in protection. Um, right. right. Okay. So yeah. And mm-hmm. Endymion. Okay. So they go to what's that world? That is the Templar world. The, the that world got God's all, Grove. All, God's Grove. Yeah. Right? God's Grove. That got, yep. that got completely destroyed because, you know, all trees. Right. 
everything burns. Yeah, and and you mentioned that it's uh, uh, like the Jesuit planet or whatever, but there was uh, there was an Islamic planet. Um, you know, they're just places that people went and they they settled in with their own lifestyles, and um, now have been damaged. Really, I mean, because we've had the complete collapse of society of interstellar society. Um, right. But they're they're all these planets were hurt by the disappearance of the Farcasters. Right. So anyway, but yeah, but then on God's Grove, that's when Aenea, um, Nemes have a confrontation. Right. And what a confrontation it is. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, Endymion really has an, an awesome climax in yeah. that. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're with Father DeSoya, who is his chasing after, and, you know, we get a real sense that he's trying to figure things out, but he's also trying to fulfill his mission and all that. And Ania has her own, um, you know, path to walk and she knows kind of what she's doing. Raw is just along for the ride. He doesn't know anything. He feels, he feels totally inept. Right. But what a showdown at the end because of Endymion, because we have, the Nemesis, who has now shown itself to be just a complete inhuman monster. Um, I'd like to just touch on real quick, uh, when, when uh, Nemesis shows up to the uh, ice world of uh, Sol Draconi, mm-hmm. is that right? Yep. Um, when she shows up there, she shows up just a little bit too late. They've already made it through the Farcaster on that world. But she shows up and she finds the priest that's there that has dealt with um, Ania and Roll and Vedic. And it's a very quick calculation to figure out whether or not she, uh, the Nemesis should let this priest live or not. And if she lets, or it, lets him live um you know more than likely he 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 will never tell anybody or anything and and there's no big deal but if the nemesis kills him well then it's a hundred percent certainty so she kills him Mm -hmm. there is no humanity yeah just a calculation right Right. calculation and and odds and statistics and right Right. and purpose so we see very quickly that this is a product of the techno core this is not a, a product of a feeling, um, empathetic uh, being. Yeah. And so uh, we, we, uh, we get a sense of, of, that, of that horror and then the relish in which Nemesis takes to the final confrontation mm. just builds it up to uh, a, a wonderful degree. And when it goes down, it goes down. Very well. Dan Simmons um, really writes some amazing action. Am I right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was one, and then there's one in the next book that I'll never forget. Um, right. Yeah. So very, we have, very, uh, very good. Yeah. We have, uh, yeah, Ania and Raw and Bedick going down the river and God's Grove, um, just, just making it to the next Farcaster, and we... Uh, see the nemesis waiting and setting traps. And when they come upon the traps and everything uh, starts going down, the strike shows up. And we have such an amazing uh, brawl hmm. in, in fast time between the nemesis and the strike because the nemesis actually has control of time much like the strike, not exactly like, but much like the strike does, and there is um, there is there is just amazing, amazing stuff with that scene. So good, right? Really, really and, excellent. Um, yeah, it's excellent. It really is something. I mean, and then there is uh, there know, is something that's that's revealed right around then that is just extremely disturbing, and it hints to what's coming in the next one. What's and that? that is that um, Ania starts to talk about what happened to Earth, right? And that Earth, right. the Technocore wasn't the thing that made it disappear. 
Right. Um, but then they, she also suggests that there's a reason that Hebron, which is a Jewish planet, is empty. And a reason why, um, I can't remember what the name of the Islamic planet is, but it was also empty. And you said that was a mystery. But why it's empty as well. And um, that it's the Tenacore that was behind that. Right. To the church's That's benefit. Right. To the church's right. benefit. Well, they, and they start seeing, mm-hmm. is that where they start seeing the, uh, the bodies? Yeah, right. Right. There's this mass exodus of a planet. Now, there's like the Shrike is there, and the Shrike takes out a bunch of people and all this kind of thing. And, and uh, they send that other colonel or mm-hmm. somebody in the packs there as as a punishment once again but they are there to investigate what has happened there and and it's and it's horrific and all these people are dead and stuff but there's so many people missing and then right. it, as it turns out there's these people that are in like a cryogenic fugue but it's not it's not from human means they mm-hmm. are alive they are uh, in a in a in a comatose state, and they are being used by the Technicore for some kind of reason. Sure, the big reveal there to me is the fact that the Technicore and the Church seem to have some similar goals. Right, right, and exactly. Suddenly, right. you're like, hmm. Right, right? at that point, right. you're like, what is actually yeah, happening te- here? That that uh, and and Bledo, or I, I don't know how to pronounce his name because I just read it, but uh, that the Technocore persona, he actually is exerting, or it is exerting its will, mainly through the church, through the Pax. Which is fascinating, right? Because right. they were not, they were at odds before. <laughs> right. right. But now well, it's like the Pax understand. is all powerful, but it turns out, oh, we're... Uh, we're maybe in cahoots with the Technicore, not against the Technicore. Immortality is that just that kind of shiny carrot to dang dangle in front of humanity, isn't it? Right. That's and just, and that's uh, just what and it the, is. Right. And the um the Technicore is the, the, you know, they're like preventing the existence of God kind of, right? Right. The the because remember last time we talked about how um, when the Technicore got out to the Eternity, there was something else there. And then it talked right. about the Omega Point, right? And the Omega Point being that humanity is going to get to a point sometime in the future that, and God will kind of spawn from humanity. Or it's like all of humanity is God, right? And then right. God gets to Eternity, and then now God is outside time, and then God exists forever and has right. always existed. So Just like the UI. Just exactly like the UI, right. exactly right. And the the um, Technicore doesn't want that to exist, so that's their motivation. And the Pax right. has turned into a power hungry group of people, and that's why they exist. And now they're in cahoots. They've been collaborating. So they've been collaborating through this, you know, two to three hundred years since the fall that's of right. Hyperion. Right. Right. And then now they're fearing. They fear Ania. They fear Ania because Ania can destroy that balance. Right, and that's and that's from the start. They they talk about Aenea as a as a virus mm. and as something that uh, will bring down the entire uh, power structure. Heck yeah! So what happens at the very end of um, that is they they get out of that and now they end up on basically old Earth, right? Old Earth, kind of in a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, comes out of nowhere. You know, so it's another right. it's another uh, cybrid, like the Keats cybrid. Um, right. But it's like a Frank Lloyd Wright and, cyber and on like old, old Earth. Earth is like a yeah. is like a is like a, a whole world of, yeah. of of these cybrids and and human beings and just and and projects. Yeah, that's what old Earth is all about at that point. And um, I want to you know also uh, they get out because there's the the big showdown between the Nemesis and the Shrike and it and it's ridiculously awesome but they get out because Father DeSoya um uh, uh what they call apostatizes mhm yep right right he, he he decides that he's not going to 
uh, fulfill his mission of the church. He's going to align himself with Aenea, and he uh, takes out the Nemesis by uh, blasting the rock and melting it, and Nemesis falls into a uh, molten rock <laughs> yeah. uh, column mm -hmm. and gets uh, kind of uh, locked in inside of molten rock column. Baked right in there. And then <laughs> gives Aenea and Raw and Bedic uh, the ship. Gives them a ship so that they can continue on and just lets them free and they go to Old Earth. So Desoya does that. He defects from uh, the Pax because he knows, he, he sees that Nemesis is a monster. He sees that this is not human. This is not the, not the way to go. Yep, very good. So then now uh, they're on old earth and Ania, you know, they're they're living that way. What is her occupation? Do you remember? She's teaching, right? Well, you know, uh, no, she's a she's a student uh -huh. of the of that guy at first, right? Of the Frank Lloyd Wright guy. guy. They, and and he is uh and she is a builder. She's an architect. Uh, she's a carpenter. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. So another messianic. Yeah. You know, very a, much so, yeah. A symbol very much. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> That's cool. There's there's a little thing that happens here where uh, Nia actually gets to age in relation to Raul um, because she goes somewhere. She travels somewhere, and um, then it takes a while for Raul to catch up to her. But because of this right. time debt well, thing that sends, happens when there's she travel. Sends Raul. Yeah, she sends, she sends Raul. She says that he's going to, okay, Bedek makes that raft. He makes a copy. And and uh, and he sends uh, she sends Roll on a mission. Says that you need to go through the Farcaster and go get the shit back. Go get the Council's shit. And um, he says he says okay. You know he's going to listen to whatever Ania says to do. Of course, mm -hmm. right. everybody is. I mean, if you know who Ania is, so he does it. And he's on a year and a half more. Mm -hmm. Then a year and a half, maybe two years, journey to find the council ship. Mm -hmm. And so Raw is alone, and we follow Raw through this super trippy. I love this part of the series because there's so much world building, and Dan Simmons is a freaking genius mm -hmm. to um, build so many worlds, and Raw is going through, and, um, and he's going back to get the ship. While that's happening, we hear nothing of Aenea, of course, because Raul is our storyteller, you know? Yep, and then when he returns, uh, or when they're reunited, they're reunited on a Buddhist planet. And on the Buddhist right. planet is where they see Aenea, and she's now like 21 years old. <laughs> and she was right. 16 before, and now yeah. she, so she's an adult. She's grown up a lot since, yeah. you know, With and, and Raul, changed. What did it take, a few weeks? Yeah. It took... It took well, mm -hmm. he got he got stuck on that one planet where he where he got a urinary tract infection, or was it kidney stone? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. I don't know what it was, but it was it was mm -hmm. it was so cool to me. Uh, I love when um, and this this is what strikes me as like grand storytelling, mm -hmm. where something happens with a character that is 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 kind of mundane, mm -hmm. and it just is like something that happens to people. And but it is it is imperative to their path, and he gets stuck on a planet, and Nemesis shows up, and we see that the Shrike is actually on the uh, trip with Raw, mm. because the Nemesis shows up, and okay, so in Rise of Endymion we gotta touch on first that at the beginning of Rise of Endymion, two more Nemesis creatures show up mm -hmm. and they pull the original nemesis up out of the rocks right mm -hmm. and then they are on their their mission is to stop ania but they can't get to ania they can't get to old earth so they're hunting raw and where they find raw is where he gets stuck with the uh I, I think it's a urinary tract infection. Am mm -hmm. I right? I don't remember that detail. It's a urinary tract infection, mm -hmm. or it's a, or it's a kidney stone, where he's like stuck on that planet, and they are all 
a, mm -hmm. a, a society that has rejected the cruciform. Mm -hmm. And he's bedridden and he's stuck there for a long time. And the Nemesis creatures show up and they hunt through the whole society. And they're just in time for him to get back, you know, like on his raft and go. Well, then we see like a different iteration of the Shrike. The Shrike is bigger and badder than we ever expected. He's way mm -hmm. bigger and badder than he was at the end of Endymion, where he has his showdown with the Nemesis because he almost gets his butt kicked <laughs> by right. the Nemesis at the end of Endymion. But in Rise of Endymion, he kills two of the Nemesis creatures. You know, he kills two of them. He rips one of their heads off and throws it in the river yep. and stuff. So mm -hmm. he's bigger and badder than ever. But we see that the Shrike is actually following Rawl on his quest. Yeah, which is interesting, you know, because he was he was protecting Aenea, we thought. Right. So, yeah, during during their separation then, um, Aenea tells Rawl that she married someone and had a kid. And they were together right. for two years. And... Uh, right. Yeah, that's, Rall, that's tough Rall on Rall. Gets, he gets the ship and he makes it back and he and he goes to their meeting point, which is that mm. Buddhist planet. Yeah. And uh and yeah, um he's like, What have you what have you done? You know, now this is a woman. This isn't a kid anymore. This is a woman that I'm with. What have you done for the last two years, you know? And she, and and it comes out that she has had a relationship, had a kid, and um it was just part of what she had to do. And she's very cryptic about it. And it mm -hmm. eats at Raw for the rest of the series. Yeah, for sure. Of the, the rest, rest of, of this, this book, book. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's awesome stuff. And then, um, so it's not soon after that that he meets um, Hat Mustin and um, uh, Fedman Kassad again, right? Two of the original Hyperion pilgrims. And that's where he... Yeah, and that's when we start learning about we start getting really deep at that point because we're talking about the void that binds. We're mm -hmm. talking about the cruciforms and the cruciforms being provided by the Technicore to the church. Well, they're talking about it. They're talking about it on the Buddhist planet, and I want to touch on it first because the world building is so beautiful there, and you and you're and you're just kind of like, what is happening? You know, like what has been going on, other than you know the cryptic. Of relationship that has been happening. Mm -hmm. What it, what is Aenea's deal? And we find out that Aenea is actually adding her blood, her actual blood, to a communion with human beings, which will reject the cruciform. If you have the cruciform, it is rejected. It will it will uh, be uh, it, it will fall off. It will. Uh, go away for you. You will not be immortal anymore. And she is the um, the cure for the cruciform. And so she's been doing this, and she's been doing this on planet after planet, wherever they have gone, her and Bedic, during this time. She's been uh, sharing her blood, her actual blood, with uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. And Rawl is not privy to take part in that communion for some reason. And they go, uh, they leave old earth and then they go to, uh, <laughs> to that level, uh, where we, where we get to the most amazing sci-fi in the entire series. I think where they are on the ouster, uh, because that was part of, uh, the mission that Celius Sel said to Roll that they need to meet with the Ousters and then bring back Old Earth. So they meet with the Ousters and they are on, you know, who knows where, you know, way out, way out in the galaxy somewhere where the Templars have been working with the Ousters for so long to uh, create this huge Dyson Sphere technology that is an ecosystem that is built around a star yeah, and right. It, it, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> this is, this part is just, just mind blowing. Yeah. Right. And, and in there, that, that's where uh, Hatmustine and Fedman Kassad are. Right. 
and that right. they they meet those guys again, and then now that's when Raul right. is learning the truth about what the cruciforms are, um, and he also right. and it basically is saying that when this resurrection happens, it uses the void, <clears throat> and the void is like you know, huge computing power, right? You know, it's like right. all, all this computing power, it needs to exist. And, but it damages the void somehow every time this happens. And well, then, the way the Technicore uses it damages it right, every time. Exactly, because right. the Technicore is who's really doing this resurrection. Right. But, the, right. but they're using the void to do it, right? Okay. And, and the so way they're is, doing it damages. This is the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this is the rabbit hole I fell into uh you know just kind of revisiting uh before this and let me tell you um it, it's just amazing and um to preface it what what has been said by the technocore is that the ousters are evil because they have allowed the their humanity to be augmented by nanotechnology mm -hmm. right right they they are becoming other than human and therefore they're evil and the and the church kind of understands this they're saying it in a in a way that the church understands that like okay whether you're with god and the church or you are an ouster because mm -hmm. they are actually uh alienated from their own humanity but that's not exactly the truth and this is um Aeneas own words if i can touch on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh the Rise of Endymion, <laughs> yeah. page uh, 539, okay? Okay. Thus, the cruciform. This cruciform is nanotechnology at its most refined and most injurious. Where our ouster friends used advanced genetic engineering combined with nanotechnology to advance the cause of life in the universe, the Technocore uses it to advance the cause of core hyperparasitism. The core is a parasite. Each mm -hmm. cruciform is made up of billions of core-connected nanotech entities, with each in contact with other cruciforms and the core via terrible misuse of the void which binds as its medium. The technocore has known of the void for a millennium, and used it, misused it for almost as long. The so-called Hawking Drive tore holes in the void. Then Farcasters ripped at the essential fabric of the void. The core-driven information metasphere, an instantaneous flatline, flatline medium, stole information from the void which, which binds in ways that binded, blinded entire races and destroyed millennia of memories but is the cruciform that is the core's most cynical and terrible misuse of the void medium hmm. so um these the every time okay and it then it's pointed out that every time what what the core needs is like a crisis point um, it needs to get to a crisis point in order to evolve. And these human beings that have the cruciform, every time they die, especially if they die in large numbers, that provides the crisis point for the core to make strides in, in its own evolution. So it is a parasite on humans. Mm -hmm. And Aenea sees this and uh calls it out and it is it is big ideas <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah huge i mean yeah that's incredible stuff for dan simmons to 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 come up with this oh is man. just yeah and, and it's it's uh fascinating and okay everything that you thought you knew in hyperion uh we're gonna turn it over over here in in Dimian. um it, it's right. it's one right. of the things that, that makes it so interesting um but he's you know, th this 300 years that has passed, um, you know, in this alliance that's happened, and then you have the, the Technicore now damaging the fabric of the universe <laughs> with their, uh, it's like their pol pollution kind of, right? 
Um, they're right. actually destroying things. Um, right. And it's, it's, it's really just interesting. And then the, the fact that the church, um, this is something that I'll always remember from this, you know, is how, what the church has done um, in this in cahoots with the something that they should be totally against. You know, because right. like you said, you know, they're against the ousters because the ousters are enhancing themselves with nanotech. So right. what are they doing with the Technicor? You know, um, so it's completely, right. totally hypocritical. Right. But they don't realize it. They don't realize it until the shared moment. This is like a giant correction that's happening right in front of us. Um, a giant exactly. correction of philosophy and a revelation of all these things that are hypocritical. Um, it's and so it's good. all coming to a head, right? It's it's Dan it's, Simmons is so good at doing this ultra complex. Oh, really good. And then he he's not only good at this giant macro level. He's again, we get this other fight scene that just it blew me away. I was so into it um, that um, Rawl had to fight uh, Nemesis. And right, and fight, that him, was and fight Nemesis alone. Amazing, yeah, just amazing. amazing. So yeah, he's fighting Nemesis, and Nemesis was one who could beat the Shrike, and now he's he's fighting it, and um, in protection of Aenea, and uh, just just incredible. I mean, so so at that level, it's it's he's he's amazing, and then at this macro level, he's amazing. Um, this, I, I, I can tell you, I've got so a lot fun. more Dan Simmons to read. So, oh yeah, yeah. There's so much of of a love story here, mm-hmm. and and it's driven home really, really well. Um, of a you know just the love that that they actually um, love each other above anything else. Uh, yeah. Raw and Ania, and it's driven home very well. And I think that the height of that is not uh, you know their their time alone and their and and sharing what we. Uh, see as love, the physical act of love, or even their expression of that, even in uh, Rawls uh, being jealous yeah. of what he doesn't even know about uh, the baby. Mm-hmm. And But it is in that fight scene because this is the, um, the, 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 the highest Christian ideal that is put forth um, by by, by uh, you know, the central figure of Christianity itself, that there is no higher love that you can show but to lay down your life for your friend. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's what um, is done. And Rawl walks uh, directly into almost certain death with the nemesis uh, cre- creature to fight uh, for Aenea. Um, alone yeah. and it's so affecting in this in this very visceral primal battle scene um you just get this feeling of just uh you know uh just humanity um at its most raw mm. is what it is yeah yeah it's so good yeah. so good <laughs> it really and, is um, <laughs> It really is. It, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, just just a stunning thing that he's doing. Stunning thing that he's doing. So um, yeah, so we know that Rawl is um, he's put in the uh, the Schrodinger cat box by the church. Okay. Right? Well, they the, after they have that uh, whole scene on the Auster Dyson sphere. Mm-hmm. Um, where everything is laid out and the reader is brought up to speed, really, on the level that all these different players are playing, the ousters, the technocor, and everything, and everybody. Um, Ania goes willingly to the Pax planet. And Rawl and Ania together go willingly to... Uh, to to the packs. Yep, yep. And and they get. I mean, they, it, it's almost in a, um, like a <laughs> emotional, um, lashing out kind of level where Ania is running up. You know, they're doing the mass. Mm-hmm. It's in the middle of mass. Yeah. 
And Ania starts shouting out, shouting down the, the, the Pope and going up and making a scene. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. like, why are you doing this? What is happening? And she gets willingly uh, caught. And Raw is totally, you know, it, it, it can't do anything but get caught as well. There's nothing to be done. They can fight it off all they want, but they get caught. And Raw gets put into the Schrodinger cat box. Yeah. For sure. Right? That's, right. That's, and then that's while, he's, the while he's in that box, Ania is tortured by Nemesis, right? And, right. Um, well, they, they, they are in holographic form. Mm-hmm. She's like in this room chained up above uh, the fire. And Nemesis is there in the room with her. But uh, Loud's army and the Technocore personality and then somebody else as well, um, a, a high level uh, in the in the in the packs, is there. But they're in, they're in holographic form and they're interrogating her, while Nemesis torturing her. And 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 uh, what does uh, you know? What do they want her to do? Mm-hmm. What do they want her to do? They want her to do what they know she can do, if if she really wants to. She can. Um, travel, because as it turns out, the Farcasters weren't ever doing anything. Ania <laughs> was doing it. She mm-hmm. has power over the Void Witch Binds to travel and to be in any place that she wants whenever she wants. Mm-hmm. She's uh, another level of, of human like that. Mm-hmm. Um, being in contact with the Void Witch Binds. So they have her being, uh, you know, totally uh, watched and, you know, uh, different different uh, things around her to to see to to uh, measure what is being done so that the Technocore could replicate that if they if she does it. So she can't. She knows that she can't do it if she if she can't save herself. She has to go through with this, um, whatever it is, torture, murder, whatever it is. She has to go through with it because if she does do it, then that gives the Technocore what the Technocore needs to replicate what she can do. So she can't do, and it's horrifying. Yeah, (laughs) but amazing, right? Yeah, so I mean, gosh, I mean, the whole, the Christ figure thing is complete. And, right. um, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Exactly and then, right. Yeah. Exactly and then, right. um, so we get this and her, her thoughts were broadcast when she died to humanity, right? right? Through the void. So, so she gets, uh, they, they get into a conversation, see who's, who's, uh, interrogating her ultimately is the Technocore and she knows it. It's the Technocore personality and he's, he's just goading her. To do what she can do, and, and isn't that? Refuses. I mean, that comes straight from the Bible too. You remember right. when Jesus was tempted? Yeah, the temptation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly right. Yeah, and so, um, uh, one of the the other priests, not Loud's army, but the other high level person in there, uh, starts saying, uh, you know, has a conscience mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. starts saying, you know, what is going on here? You, uh, stop this! You know, this yeah. is this is not what we're here for, and. And with a motion, with a motion of his hand, um, the Technocore personality does something with the cruciform that we've seen one other time so far in the books. He did it with uh, the leader of that mercantile. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and he uses the cruciform to inflict unbelievable pain on that person just, 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 just because... It shows that the the cruciform is a product of the techno core. Right, right. So that is seen like right then, and right then, Loud's army is like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Like <laughs> mm-hmm. now, now this is this is not what I've signed up for, you know? Yeah. Um, and Loud's army pulls the trigger on just killing Ania. And and therefore releases her from the torture and releases her from everything, yeah. By by killing her, and 
Um, her death becomes that shared moment. That is the moment. Um, it's so um, striking in the uh, in the void which binds that not just evolved humans, not just people that have had um, Aeneas' blood can feel it, but everybody feels it and sees it. And Rawl in his um, Schrodinger cat box sees it and feels it as well. Mm-hmm. And, we, and, we, and we experience all that through that. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's amazing. It is. It's stunning. It's stunning um, what happens there, and what that does is it triggers a rebellion, um, right, against the Pax right. and the Tentacore. Right. Yeah. Everybody sees that uh, the, the cruciform is a product of the Tentacore, and they and they've been had. Yeah. And this is and this is not the way. Uh, this is not humanity any longer. Exactly. And I love, I love the, I love the way that, um, you know. Uh, the shrike, which is death, you know, death becomes, uh, what death always is, um, always really is, um, which is a, a friend of humanity. Hmm. Uh, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be human beings if death wasn't, uh, something that we had to, had to go through and something yeah. that, uh, mm. it, you know, is part of life. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Dan Simmons is, is very, very, uh, high level <laughs> with very that high level, very high level. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. And then, uh, the, the last moment, uh, as far as I'm concerned that, that we definitely want to hit is what happens after, right? Cause Rawl gets right. out of his Schrodinger box. Right. And then, well, he, and, and so, I think that's part of why he had to go through all the worlds and why he had to do what he had to do is because this is all a growth level of, um, for raw and, and he grows. And then through the shared moment, he, uh, actually gets to the level or close to the level that Ania is actually on and he can travel. Yeah, and then he travels. So then he right. can he travel. Free cast, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, and Boom. he has, and he knows he's been to all these planets. He has an affinity for all these different humans and different planets and all this stuff. So he can then do that. And he just, and he blinks out and he blinks where he wants to go. And um, he gets to um, Old Earth and they go to, and they get to, uh, well, they go to the, the um the tree the templar with the tree they get martin silius who uh the final uh, you know one of his final things is he wants to see old earth before he dies and he wants to talk to ania before he dies you know mm-hmm. well you know raw for all his uh you know ineptitude he still has attained uh, many of the directives that uh Martin has had given him at the beginning, but ultimately he still failed at this point. We don't know how, how, how things are going to work out, but they uh, get, he picks up Martin and everything and they go to old earth. That's the directive is to uh, go to old earth. And Hmm. they're told (laughs) to, uh, to go down to old earth and for two years, Nobody uh, can can disturb them. Mm-hmm. Only Martin and Rawl and uh, Bedick and uh, is, is there anybody else? Not not that I recall. Um, yeah, just, Martin, yeah. Rawl, Bedick. But it's they, basically they can, you know this, go this nobody's going to come down to that planet other than for you guys two for two years. Yeah, right. And then uh, humans can repopulate Old Earth, and Old mm-hmm. Earth is brought back by the Void Witch Binds to its place in the soul uh, system. And they go down, and um, I mean, it, it was just it was just the most triumphant conclusion to any story. I mean, especially sci-fi that I've ever read. Yeah, when 
they go down and um, Rawl is completely, you know, for all that he has attained, completely heartbroken. He just has taken part in the love of his life being tortured and murdered. Mm -hmm. And he's eaten up by it and it just is what it is. And he's down there and, and then we look off on the horizon and he sees the shrike and he sees Ania walking toward him. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, I awesome. Could, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe, um, what I was reading at that point. And, uh, when yeah, I remember you, I, and, you told and, me like, at the time how affected you were by it. It's great. Right. I mean, when, when mm -hmm. I saw it, I, you know, I, I didn't have any kind of ideas about what could happen, but one, right when it said that the Shrike and the Nia are walk, were walking towards them, uh, then it all flooded in. Mm. I understood that, like, well, this is those two years. The Shrike is the Time Lord. Mm -hmm. He brought Ania here. This is the two years. Raul is the dad. <laughs> Ania is, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, and, 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 and I tell you, I could not hold back the uh, tears of joy oh, that's awesome. that were going on. And I said, yes, 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 as <laughs> I was. I mean, I, 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 I don't remember being so elated during uh, a reading of anything. Mm. Um, then at the very end of Rise of Endymion, because mm. I was just like, yes, yes, yes. You know, I was not near as affected by the torture and murder of <clears throat> Ania, mm -hmm. it didn't affect me like that. Um, you know, the negatives don't affect me. I mean, the, the world sucks, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, humans are horrible uh, beings some of the time. A lot of the time, it could be argued. Yeah. But to have something so life-affirming and joyous um, brought out by a fiction work... Um, I don't, I don't know that I've ever experienced something as done so well. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I, I loved it too. Um, I just thought it was great. Um, for me, you know, it, it occurred to me that Rawl was going to be the father that she was talking about, but I had no idea how it was going to work out. But in my head, I guess maybe that was what I was hoping for. Um, right. But it like was, you said, uh, I mean, I yeah. get it. Yeah, it <laughs> like was it, great. It couldn't, it couldn't work out any other way. Very, very. There's satisfying no way. End. Yeah, that's for awesome. it to make it, you know, a, a satisfying. Yeah. Story, um, mm -hmm. any other, any other way. Sure. So, yeah. um, it, it 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 totally makes sense for the feeling of the story, mm -hmm. but that he worked it out in a rational. <laughs> you know, uh, for all the for all the complexity and craziness that we've gone through here, that he made it work out uh, in a in a rational way within the story is just ah, uh, it's mind blowing. Yeah, what an amazing what an amazing writer. What an amazing work, no question. Um, what an amazing work. Yep, yep. It's a yeah, yeah. Overall, um, I, I yeah, it's it's going to be with me forever. Uh, it's something that I, I'm going to reread. Um, I know I told you at one time, you know, I don't know that I'll reread the Endymion novels, but um, the farther away I get from them, the more is there. And then this discussion too, um, you're, you're an enthusiastic guy. I, I'm sure you know that about yourself. <laughs> but there's just right. something where you're like a contagious person, and uh, it's good stuff. You're your own virus. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, but I tell you what, it, you know, listening to this, um, you know, participating in this conversation again, deepened my love of these. Um, and, uh, like I said, Hyperion is the masterwork and then, um, but, but all of these together itself is a masterpiece too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, when people approach, you know, it's like the Dune series. It, and and then and again, you know, it's it's hard not to compare it to that. But it is like the Dune series in that that like Dune, the first book, is is a is a complete masterpiece. And you and most people read it and don't go on to anything else. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. like um, in this series, I'm sure, 
you know, a lot of people have read the first book and then never read it any others. Yeah. But the series as a whole is so good. And um, I, ho- I just hope that people, you know, mm-hmm. you owe it to yourself. If you're a lover of sci-fi and, um, and, and I mean, Dan Simmons is, is more than just a sci-fi writer for sure. Right. Yeah. No question. I mean, what a, fact, you know, a, you, a very. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, in fact, he doesn't. He hasn't written a lot of science fiction. When you look at <laughs> his, when you look at his bibliography, which I've got in front of me now, um, he's written the Hyperion four novels, and then he's written Ilium and Olympos, which is a pair. Right. He seems to like the pairs, right? And right. other than that, there's a, a standalone or two, like the Hollow Man, could be science fiction. Um, Darwin's Blade is possibly science fiction, and the rest of right. what he's written here, he's got uh, is horror. I would say, um, right? You know, so he's got a Seasons of Horror yeah. series, and then he's got this thing called Joe Kurtz, which I think is more of a hard, uh, hard boiled detective novels. And then, um, you know, the Song of Callie was his first book, which uh, I've read, and it's a it's a fantasy novel. In fact, you'd be all over that one. Song of Cali, write that one down. <laughs> nice. That's his first novel, yeah. right? So he isn't as mature I'm as he it. is here. But he wrote Hyperion not long after Song of Cali. And Song right. of Cali won like the World Fantasy Award. So um yeah, Crazy. he's he's just tops. Um but I uh, got I got a I got a book called The Winter Haunting. A mm-hmm. Winter Haunting. Yeah. You know, just like a small you know, kind of like a genre a uh-huh. uh, ghost story. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I've heard about Drood. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot about Drood. And I've yeah. heard a lot of the terror. They did a, an yeah. adaptation of that. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's obviously just uh, a virtuoso. Yeah. Like, he's just, he's, just, he's just a great writer. He really he, is. He gets it. He's mm-hmm. a great storyteller. And that's just it. Once mm-hmm. he gets an, an idea and wraps his head around it, he knows how to execute what is in his head, mm-hmm. and he does it really, really well. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, and what a trip this has been, Noah. This took, a, this took us a while. I'm, I'm really, really happy you uh, were along for this ride, too, because, I mean, I, I, I had no idea what I was getting into at the beginning of this, that's for sure. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. But, yeah. But yeah, thank you for this discussion. Um, that's been it's been a heck of a lot of fun. Thoroughly enjoyed myself, um, and this is top rate stuff. So we definitely need to do this again. Yeah, yeah. For those of you uh, who aren't on BookTube, uh, go check out Noah's channel. Um, everyone who reads must converse. Um, go check it out. I'll have a link here on the post so that uh, you can check them out. And please do. Thank you. You bet. Take care now. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, man. 